<clears throat> so you need to unmute, my dear. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to this special dual Sangha retreat organized by Vera Rochanda on behalf of Anukampa Bikuni Project. Uh, my name is Rani, and I'm one of the co-hosts assisting Vera Rochanda on this Zoom platform along with Derek, which is uh, in charge for the Q&A for the afternoon session, and Matthias uh, as a co-host. Uh, I'll be recording and live streaming the teaching session for morning and evening sessions. So as what Venerable Chanda has mentioned earlier, Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda founded Anukampa in 2016. Uh, it's a UK charity with a dual aim of promoting the teachings and practices of early Buddhism and developing the first monastery in the UK where women can train to work full bhikkhuni ordination. Ajahn Brahm has been coming to teach us in England in support of this aim every year since then. <clears throat> but due to the COVID pandemic, for the second year running, we are extremely grateful that he has agreed Ooh. to teach <laughs> online for us, along yeah. with Verba Chanda, instead of coming in person. So we're very grateful for that, Ajahn Brahm. And in the true spirit of Buddhism, this retreat and all the teachings are offered freely in spirit of generosity. Neither of the teachers will receive any material remuneration for their wisdom or time. At the end of the retreat, you will be invited to offer donations or dana to help us achieve our monastery aims and you can do this entirely at your own discretion via our website link at www.anukampaproject.org slash donate. So this retreat is also an important event for Anukampa as it helps to build our building community and strengthen local and international support. On the last day of the retreat, we will also share more about the different ways you may like to be involved. Um, but the most profound support of all though is in deepening our practice together. And it is really delightful to have people joining us from all over the world. We have from Sri Lanka, we have from Germany and everywhere. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Venerable Chanda, who will welcome Ajahn Brahm and orient you into the retreat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hani. Very beautifully introduced. So yes, welcome to this retreat. This is the Emboldening the Mind with Fizz and Sparkle retreat. And uh, for those tuning in on live stream, we are recording this now on Facebook. So hello to you as well. You're in the right place. And uh, we hope you enjoy following along some of these sessions with us. So welcome to the shared space of spiritual community. We are going to be together for the next seven days and the retreat will start very shortly with um, an introduction and the precepts from Ajahn Brahm. So you have an opportunity to take either the five or the eight precepts. And uh, for those who have read, all the information, you'll know that the five precepts are the basic uh, ethical virtues and the eight include not eating after midday. Um, many of you are in Europe, so that would mean eating between this session and the second one. Um, so if you want to take eight, that's a little bit of a further enunciation. So it's entirely up to you. So we're going to be finishing this retreat on uh, Sunday at 3 p.m. after a final teaching session by Ajahn Brahm and also we'll have an opportunity at that time to share our experiences with the other participants. Um, until then we'll just be in silence and practicing as if we we're alone. So on the website we've explained that this retreat is designed to be spacious and to give you a lot of personal practice time as well as a lot of teaching input. Um, but we really encourage you to find your own rhythm and pace with the practice 
and we'll give you some tips on how to make best use <coughs> excuse me of that time especially your personal practice time and uh, we are asking for full-time attendance for this retreat and it's very encouraging to see that most of you are here this morning and uh this is to help you get the full benefit of the practice because it's really the continuity of practice that's the secret of success, as my first teacher used to say. So practicing on a home retreat is quite different from just watching the online talks. Of course, those who are watching online talks can try to have a retreat at the same time if you're fortunate to be in that position. Um, but we're really trying to recreate the same conditions that you'd have in a residential in-person retreat. Um, so one of the powerful ways that it differs from watching the online talks is that we carve out a space that's dedicated to solitary and silent practice with none of the usual distractions and disturbances that you have in your everyday life. So essentially you're taking time out of your everyday life <clears throat> to delve deeply into your inner world. So to support yourself in this process, please try to maintain noble silence. And this also includes not using electronic devices like the one that I'm reading from. <laughs> uh, so try not to do that, um, such as your mobile phone or even emails. You know, obviously you need to find the link for this retreat, but you can probably paste that somewhere other than your email box, your inbox. Otherwise, you're likely to get distracted by people contacting you. You can even put a little vacation responder on your email account, and then you feel more protected from the outside. Um, so such noble silence really helps cultivate what we call sense restraint. And that in turn facilitates the quietening of the mind and the cultivation of inner happiness and peace. So we're asking all retreatants to try and use this Zoom room as a virtual Dhamma hall. If you remember all those years ago when we used to sit together in meditation halls. <laughs> we'll try to create that kind of environment here. So as, just as you'd maintain silence in the Dhamma Hall, you remain silent in this room. So that even as we're together, we work as though we were alone. Uh, for your Zoom settings, you can choose to have this on speak of you. You'll see at the top right corner, there's a little um, box with like nine little squares that says view and you can either have speak of you whereby you'll only see whoever's talking at the time or you can have gallery view where you'll see all the other participants as well and just see what feels most supportive to you sometimes it can be nice to just focus on the, the speaker other times you might want that sense of being here with others so you can experiment but we do ask that you please don't interact with each other at this time until the end of the retreat um, because obviously anyone you interact with is also on retreat and it, it really supports them if we try to work individually as if we're alone. So normally for those who come to my online sessions, there's a chat box uh, to use to speak to each other, to say hello. Um, but we're going to disable that function this time. So if you have questions for Ajahn Brahm or for me during the Q&A sessions, so that's the session from uh, 12 to 1.30 in the afternoon. That's UK time. So in Europe, maybe 1 to 2.30. And there's people from all over the world here. So you can work that out. The second session will be an opportunity to put questions to Ajahn Brown. And then the evening session will be an opportunity to put questions to me. And we'll do that by submitting them to either Derek or any who will use the name Q&A. So now you see it's Q&A Derek and later it will be Q&A Rennie. No one else will see your question and it will limit the amount of interaction we have. So in the afternoon, I'll read out the questions for Ajahn Brown. And in the evening, I guess I read them myself. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> 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 okay, so please keep your questions concise and related to your meditation practice, especially concise is really key because then it enables us to really uh, attend to many people's questions. So not whole life stories, but of course, sometimes things might come up that, you know, a bit more complicated, but just try to put it in a way that um, enables many people to have an opportunity to ask. Um, and at most we'd recommend one question per person per day. It is quite a big group. There's about 70 people here 
<clears throat> so without any further discussion, I'm going to now hand over to Ajahn Brown and say how grateful and delighted we are to have you with us again, Ajahn. It's always a very special time of year when Ajahn can be with us. And as we were saying, normally it's in person, but now it's online. However, it can still feel quite intimate and very supportive and nourishing to be in this space together. And that's why we do ask for the full-time attendance because it's amazing. After a while, you actually forget that you're in an online retreat and you're not in an actual retreat. So it's really a precious opportunity to have the deeper teachings and to take them a bit further through this period of solitude. So I'm sure everyone is just as delighted as I am to have you here, Ajahn. And in my little <laughs> blurb, it says that you don't need an introduction because you're not only famous, but you're also infamous, mainly for very good <laughs> things like ordaining bikinis. Um, but I do think that not much needs to be said. I'll say one thing, which is that yesterday it was Ajahn Brahm's 47th uh, anniversary as a monk. Well, so this is yeah. really amazing, right? I mean, I'm only 46. Yeah. So I think I was waiting to be born until I jumped in the monk. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been ordained as long as I've been alive and a bit longer. Yeah, actually. yes. Okay. Very inspiring. So handing over to you now for the precepts and the refuges and to introduce the day. So thank you very much. And please thank have you. a wonderful retreat. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. I agenda. It's very nice to be of service wherever you can be and however you can do it. I get a lot of inspiration out of that. So many people you've served over those last 47 years. But now I was supposed to be giving the refuges and the precepts before I actually give those. When I started keeping our precepts, it meant so much to me. And sometimes that you see how these precepts, when they're really understood, they just make you more free. They make you just more able to enjoy your life by letting go of all these other little things which get in the way of your peace and happiness. There's just, there's just things we just don't do. We don't kill beings. We don't uh, steal anything. And even things like that, it means people can leave things around and they know they'll be protected. And you know, no adultery, no... Um, lying which is a wonderful thing to actually to be honest and people know you're honest and no alcohol or drugs you don't need them that's really a wonderful thing to know that when all your friends were you know going out to parties and getting drunk you know i would go to the same party but never take alcohol and you, know, you had a much better time and you felt much better about yourself afterwards and as you go do more precepts it becomes more empowering it's as if you are being free, freeing yourself from all of those um, things which try to control you. You know what it's like when you get into these bad habits, it's very hard to stop them. And when it comes to the, the next precepts of the A precepts, there's learning how to restrain yourself. And there's many things you don't need to do, like entertainment. And sometimes you see monks and nuns, we don't watch movies or or go to clubs or whatever. But, you know, sometimes we laugh so much. It's, it's, it's crazy. Sometimes people think you must be on drugs. We're not on drugs. We're free of those things. They have all the natural energy. You have lots of happiness. So all these little things which we do, yeah, they're restraints, but they free us. They give more energy, a more sense of being at peace in this world. So anyway, I'll now give those precepts. And I will start with the three refuges because that's how we usually start. So those of you who want to join in, I will do them in English. Hopefully that's okay for, for you all. So you put your hands up if you wish. And you say, with, say after me, I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge to the Dhamma. I go for refuge to the Sangha. For the second time, I go for refuge to the Buddha. For the second time, I go for refuge to the Dhamma. For the second time, I go for refuge to the Sangha. 
For the third time, I go for refuge to the Buddha. For the third time, I go for refuge to the Dhamma. For the third time, I go for refuge to the Sangha. And that completes the three refuges. <laughs> Beautiful thing to do. And over the years, the more you practice, the more you feel their power. And now we have the precepts. The first precept is, I, I will refrain from deliberately killing living beings. I will refrain from deliberately taking what is not given in the form of stealing. And the third precept, I will refrain from sexual misconduct. And if you're taking the eight precepts, that is extended, deepened, to our refrain from all sexuality. Just during the retreat time, long if you wish. But the fourth precept, I will refrain from lying or deceiving people. For the fifth precept, I will refrain from taking alcohol or non-medicinal drugs, which weaken my mindfulness. And those of you who are taking the eight precepts, we have these three extra precepts, and I will refrain from uh, eating uh, solid food in the period after noon until the dawn of the next day. During that period, you can still uh, have juices like orange juice and, um, and tea and coffee and chocolate and cheese. And it's, it's up to you really how you interpret these things. Sometimes milk or soya milk, but nothing really solid. Uh, and the next precept is to, this is a long precept, is to refrain from, um, first of all, adorning your body with jewelry or makeup. Uh, in other words, uh, it's okay to wash and to use deodorants, but not just to have anything which entices other beings to be um, close to you. In other words, it's just ordinary, just uh, what you might call, uh, I can't think of the word now, but just cleanliness and uh, good um, hygiene, hygiene is the word I was looking for, but not just to anything which is uh, beautifully smelling or beautiful looking, simple clothes, simple attire, and also not uh, looking at music or entertainment videos or anything which again disturbs the mind in the sense of entertainment. It's okay to listen to my jokes because I'm sure you all know that many of my jokes aren't that funny. So it's very hard to call them entertainment. <laughs> and then we have the, um, the last precept is not using luxurious furnishings. So in other words, that we don't deliberately go out and uh, have uh, really luxurious chairs or seats to sit on. It's not just um, mentioning, if, if you need that for a comfortable sleep at night or um, comfort when you're sitting in meditation, that's fine. What it was really referring to is where people um, use like high seats as a form of their superiority, as uh, their ego uh, is on a high seat or luxurious furnishings such as big beds. And uh, they're not really as comfortable as sleeping on the floor, in my opinion, but nevertheless, they do that just to show off to other people. So we refrain from doing things like that. In other words, we have simplicity. And those are the eight precepts. So you can determine to, you, to keep those eight precepts or those five precepts, however you can during this retreat. Now we usually say five precepts or eight precepts, but some people do six precepts or seven precepts, simply because you may have some indigestion or something and you need to eat something in the afternoon. Keep it simple. And you understand the purpose of these five precepts or eight precepts. In other words, having a comfortable body, but not indulging. 
and keeping things simple in life. And that's actually what those precepts mean. They're not a burden, but they're a gateway to freedom. So then you say, for the next uh, seven days, I determine to keep these precepts. Great. So having done that, we're now going to have a short Dhamma talk about meditation and followed it uh, in, uh, I think I'm going to have to do half an hour little talk and then do a guided meditation. So when we do our meditation, I think I've seen many of you before. So I think you all know that how I teach meditation is one of the most simple things in the world to do. One of the reasons people find it difficult is because they don't do it properly. By doing it properly, I mean that sometimes they put so much effort into uh, their meditation. They really try so hard. And instead of trying so hard, we have this other idea of lowering your expectations. I mentioned this recently because I have uh, a monk who's visiting me from one of our little uh, uh, future branch monasteries down in Albany, and he was asked. He was asked in a recent talk that when I went down to visit him, what my reaction was, and I told everybody after I visited him that it was his little uh, hermitage was beyond my expectations. He was quite surprised by that comment. And then I told him that the reason why it was beyond my expectations was because I'd lowered my expectations so far <laughs> that anything would exceed the expectations. Now, that was not just a joke. That was actually something which was very powerful because we sometimes have too many expectations and then we miss the reality of what we're experiencing. So I don't know what you know about meditation, but sometimes we have all expectations, which means we don't see the truth of this moment. We don't know how to make peace with it. We don't know how to learn from it. So little by little, during this retreat, you'll have some very interesting experiences. Some are just gonna be wonderful experiences, some not so wonderful. But nevertheless, all of those experiences you will find you can learn from and grow from. One of my first meditation teachers told me, there is no such thing as a bad meditation. And my first response to that was, sir, you don't know my meditation. <laughs> I don't know what you think I'm doing. He said, no, 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 no. All the meditations, if it doesn't go according to plan, not your expectations, that is the error there. You're expecting too much and you're not learning. You're not learning from what you're experiencing and learning the way to meditate is not to get rid of things. It's not to, to attain things. It's learning how to be here and allowing yourself to go in, go in, 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 in to this moment. And you'll find that when you want something, when you're complaining, all you're doing is strengthening what we call in Buddhism, the hindrances, the five hindrances. And as you avoid that problem, and you have this much greater Loving kindness, metta, compassion, you really are opening the door of your heart to this moment with kindness. You'll find that this moment is not nowhere near as bad as you thought it was. And you go more into it. And as you go more into this moment, you'll find that that is the way, that is the escape. It is something which the Buddha or Venerable Ananda a report of the Buddha had said, the little escapes you know, from suffering, the escapes you're going inwards, 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 inwards. 
into this body and mind, into the silence, into the present moment, into whatever you're experiencing now. And it opens up. So the simile which best represents this, and please know that I never plan my talks. I just see what comes next. And this simile is one of the most beautiful ones which I concocted uh, many, many years ago. And this was a simile about the thousand petal lotus. A lotus is a common symbol of Buddhism, all types of Buddhism. And the nice thing about the lotus is many things about the lotus. <laughs> one of the things about a lotus is you can urinate on a lotus. And all the urine, no matter how thick and smelly it is, will all fall off the leaves, the petals of the lotus, and nothing sticks to it. It still smells the same afterwards. Or you can pour Chanel number no. five over the lotus, and that too will run all off it, and so that when it's all gone, you can't even smell the perfume anymore. It still smells like a lotus. And that simile, which I, you can understand it, it's very clear, that if people praise you, it's like pouring Chanel number no. five over you, but it doesn't stick to you, you're free of that. If they criticize you, that's like urinating over the lotus. The smell doesn't linger on the lotus. All of that flows off as well. And the lotus still stays, smells the same afterwards. Now this, the lotus always has a very pure smell. It's not strong, but it's subtle and gorgeous. So this is actually the praise and blame simile of the lotus. Nothing affects you. But where we get to the, <coughs> uh, the deeper simile of the lotus, that is why a lotus is always closed up at nighttime. And as it opens, so it's closed up at nighttime. And during the, the daytime, when the sun comes out, this, the lotus starts to open up. It needs the warmth and the light of the sun to open it up. That's what sort of creates the, the mechanism for opening up the lotus. And the warmth of the sun stands for kindness, the softness, the loving kindness. And the light stands for mindfulness. It does take mindfulness and kindness to open up the lotus. In other words, what we call kindfulness. Sometimes people use mindfulness, sometimes they use willpower, but they forget the importance of the kindfulness, the gentleness, the warmth, the love. We do that when we're meditating. It's easy to love beautiful things, but to love irritating things, that's what we learn. So it opens it up. And that's the irritation, what we sometimes think is bad meditation. As that sort of, uh, we just accept it, be kind to it, go inside, where well, we go inside of it. It's its nature. That leaf opens up. We go to the next layer of petals. So that can receive the warmth and light of the sun. And that opens up to receive the next, to see the next layer of petals. So that can open up. Layer by layer by layer of petals opens up. You don't do anything, just allow the warmth, the kindness, and the mindfulness, the light, to stay on those petals of the lotus. And one by one, they open up and go deeper and deeper. And it's surprising because you start off with so maybe even a negative state, maybe a depressed state, a fed up state, or whatever, mind running all over the place. Just be with it with kindness and awareness. And what happens is you go inside and those difficulties or problems or what you think is bad meditation states, they recede away from you. They go further and further away into the distance as what you're experiencing becomes more and more beautiful, more and more subtle. 
The way of meditation is going inside, never getting rid of things or running away from things or, or um, getting more things. You go inside of things. And as you go inside of this moment, more and more and more, it becomes incredibly beautiful. That astounds you. It astounds you. There's so much joy and happiness and beauty right in this moment. What I need to do is to sit here comfortably and kindly. Awareness gets more and more strong, more and more energized, more and more peace, more and more happiness. And what is happening is that you begin to like the path of meditation. You're learning just how easy it is, how joyful it is. And after a while, like me, you might get addicted to meditation. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to get addicted to. In other words, you like it so much that experiences when you have the opportunity for a retreat, seven days. Ah, oh, great, you've got an excuse to turn off your emails. You've got an excuse not to watch the news. You've got an excuse not to do anything except, you know, just to rest, to eat, to exercise, and to go inside of yourself in your meditation. And as you do this, as you deeply go inside, the more mindfulness you have, the more mindfulness, I mean, the more energy that mindfulness has. It gets very empowered. And because it gets empowered, what you see is more and more beautiful. The deeper you go into that thousand petaled lotus, which is your body and mind, the thing which you give your name to, as you go deeper and deeper into it, the petals become more fragrant and also more beautiful. The colorings and the texture, everything becomes more subtle and delightful. And you, because you like the path, it means that when it's a time to meditate, you just want to do it. And when you don't have too much of a problem with restlessness, the mind thinking all over the place. I used to wonder, where does that restlessness come from? And often I would, if my mind would wander off somewhere, start thinking, I would go and grab it and bring it back again. And that was an endless thing which was going on, always wandering here and bringing it back again, wandering somewhere else, bringing it back again. Until you decided to use some insight. Why does the mind wander off? Thinking about things which are not important, fantasizing, dreaming. Why? And I realized that because my mind and I had a bad relationship, because I was always trying to train my mind, and my mind never lived up to my expectations. I think I could always do more. Bad Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> Instead of thinking like that, I thought, oh, come on. Be kind to your mind. And it soon we became the best of friends. I mean that. Just uh, the idea, the simile of whatever you're watching, you're enjoying, you're learning from, you're valuing, which meant it's very hard for restlessness to come up because I was with my best friend all the time, my meditation. You know what it's like when you're speaking with a good friend? You don't want people to interrupt you. You just, you, know, you may sort of you know, look, oh yeah, please, please call me later and go back to, with your best friend. That is what we call like when you get focused on the object of your meditation and nothing can really much take you away from it. You're enjoying it. There's so many times in meditation, I hope it's happened to you. If it doesn't happen to you yet, I hope it happened to you soon. Where you're meditating there and the bell goes or something so signals it's time to get out of meditation. And you see, just you can't do it. You just don't want to do it. Your mind won't let you do it. You just carry on meditating. Have a wonderful time. And during this retreat, if that happens to you at any time, you're enjoying your meditation, and somebody like me comes along and says, okay, it's now uh, time to come out of your meditation. The session is over. Please ignore me totally and just carry on meditating. 
It was your lunch time. Don't worry about that. You can always eat something later on. The point is that when the mind is still and happy, please stay with it. Imagine, just imagine for a moment, if the Buddha under the Bodhi tree on his enlightenment day had someone ring the bell. Bang! Okay, Buddha, time to get up. Time to have some lunch. Time to do something. There would be no Buddha anymore. When the meditation starts working, enjoy it to the max. It's like you're with a best friend. Time just goes by, doesn't have much of a meaning. You have a lot of wonderful times. And you learn to love the meditation. And loving the meditation, seeing the joy, the value, the happiness in it, that is how you focus the mind. It's a natural occurrence when you stop you know, searching for things. You go deep and deep inside your lotus, your body and mind. You have some incredible experiences, wonderful states of mind. You enjoy it so much that whew, not only do you get great insights, but other people see it. That's one of the wonderful things about meditation. People say, oh, yeah, but this is so selfish. I'm just taking seven days out of my life. I should be doing duties to all these other people. And uh, but look, when your meditation finishes, after seven days, you go back to your family, you go back to work or whatever it is you're doing in life. When you go back there and your, your boss at work, your family, they see you. Oh, you're such a more happy, wise, peaceful person. It happens so many times that when people, oh, they come on retreats, the benefits are huge. Just again, I, was, I think I told Aya Chandra last week that one of the fellows, came on my last retreat, which I did in November in uh, Johanna Grove. He's a local fellow, but he had a brain cancer. He had a big tumor in his brain, sort of 10 months ago. And he had a choice, well, what should I do? Take the operation and be on steroids for the rest of my life. I think that's what he told me. He decided to meditate instead. And he came to see me last November with a big smile on his face. So, she was gone. The neurosurgeon doesn't know where it went to, but he doesn't need the operation anymore in remission. And that's happened so many times. It's not a miracle. It's the fact that this meditation can relax you so much. You're having great sort of health afterwards. So those are just some of the benefits. And the happiness, your productivity, overcoming things like a Please excuse me, but every now and again, I, I confuse the words for these uh, uh, psychol psychological conditions. And I think it's ADHD. I sometimes say by mistake, ACDC. Apparently that was a rock band, <laughs> ACDC. But anyway, the, many of the psychological problems of life tend to disappear too. And if you can see some happiness and beauty and meaning, and everything. One of our problems in our modern age, especially times of COVID, that people have lost a lot of their meaning in their life. They can't go where they want to. They can't, the family life is not so, so easy. You can't visit people they love very much. People die in other countries and you can't attend their funeral services. So it's challenged what we take as the meaning of our life. And to me, I think that's always a wonderful thing we could exploit to get a more fuller meaning of life. By that, I mean, we can understand where beauty truly lies and how we can share that beauty just you know, with a bit of peace and happiness and kindness inside of ourselves. So we can actually show by our own behavior just how that beauty is spread in this world. And that's one of the reasons why I Love sort of seeing kids. That's why sometimes you go to these ceremonies and blessings and stuff. You see people's kids running all over the place. There's a sense they know very little, but they understand a lot. 
And these kids, I remember telling one of my students who wanted to go on a meditation retreat but didn't really have the, the time. And the kids told, Mommy, 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 you have to go to meditation. Oh, I can't. I haven't got the time. I'm too tired. There's so many other things to do, said Mommy. And the kids said, Mommy, you must go to meditation. The kids were only sort of uh, under 10, eight, nine or something. And mommy said, why? And the kids, so honest, so articulate. They said, because mommy, you're a much nicer mommy when you come home for meditation. And little things like that, that's how we practice compassion. Even the kids understood a little bit of meditation makes a mother, makes a father kinder. You're actually spreading kindness in this world, not just by chanting, but by doing something about it, making yourself a kinder, happier, more peaceful person, and thereby spreading the Dhamma far and wide. So that's a little talk to begin with. Uh, now what are we going to be talking about during this meditation retreat. And all the time, doesn't matter how your mind is, please value the contents of this moment. Give it kindness. It's a kindness which will allow you to be with this moment and allow you to go inside of it. And inside of it, you'll find freedom. Freedom not by getting rid of things or accumulating things. Freedom of going inside of things. The center of the storm of life. In there is where peace and wisdom lie. So that's our retreat. And you might think it's just peacefulness. But after you have a really good meditation, <laughs> you get so much energy. That's one of the reasons why we call this retreat Fizz and Sparkle. Kind of like that. Have a sparkling mind, a fizzy mind. It fizzes with kindness, it fizzes with insight, it fizzes with wisdom. And those sorts of states of mind we share with the people we pass by in our life and every moment. What a wonderful gift that is. So it's not just about you, it's about everybody. Everybody will meet in life. And little by little, you find it's such an easy thing to do. Actually, you just don't do it. You just sit here. Be quiet. Don't try and get things. Be kind. And all these wonderful things happen. So there we go. That's the introduction talk. I've got uh, it's, it's 5 15 p.m. over here in Australia. A nice warm summer's day. But I don't know how cold it is in UK or in Germany, or in the US, or in Portugal, wherever you are, or Germany, but never mind. Let's do a little bit of meditation now. Are you okay, ready for it? For those of you who need a toilet break, I don't call it toilet breaks, I call it letting go. Because I see just behind Venable Chanda's photo, she's got a big, a big sign there, let go. <laughs> so you can always go to the toilet if you wish. And, but I think we should really need a toilet break, should we? Nah. Anyway, that uh, if you do, you'll come back because we're going to start the guided meditation straight away. You know why? Because sometimes I like to do Meditate too. Because uh, I'll maybe quarter an hour, 20 minutes, and then I'll also uh, talk at the very end. So, so here we go. <laughs> so if you can uh, find a nice seat, because uh, I'm at the uh, desk of my little office. 
and then uh, sitting down on a chair. And once you're reasonably comfortable, oh, I'll just drink some water. It's a hot day. Then close your eyes. Remember, be kind enough to yourself, to your body. Just don't be a sort of a, uh, a cruel master or mistress over your body. Be kind to your body. Your body has looked after you for so many years. My breath, for example, my breath has never failed me once. <laughs> I'm still alive. Which means that with my breath, I trust it. In deep meditation, sometimes the breath almost disappears, but I'm never afraid because I know if I need to breathe, the breath would, will happen. I just relax, trust, and never panic. With my eyes closed, just developing that attitude of caring If you had your eyes open, you could see me just yawn. <laughs> I had a busy day, but I don't mind. I can still teach Dhamma. I can still meditate. Close your eyes. And straight away, it's natural. I don't know if it's because it's a, a habit over, over, over 50 years of meditation now. Crikey, it's a long time. Started in 1969. Nevertheless, I always become aware of my body. As I become aware of the body, I know that I'm going to be meditating for 40, 45 minutes. I've got to make sure I'm comfortable. So I just check my posture, starting off with my feet. As you all know, I never wear socks, except maybe in England when it's in the winter time. It's one of the things I haven't been to England for a while. Next time I go there, I have to get some socks. So I can feel my feet on a little mat under my little office table. You know, I love the sensitivity of this, the mindfulness. I feel all these unique feelings of my feet on the floor. But I also make sure that my feet are comfortable. And if I need to move the feet, I will do so straight away to find the optimum position. Having done this for so many years, I wonder if I really am finding the optimum position or it's just the case that my body appreciates being cared for. And so because I'm just willing to do this, the body is willing to meet me halfway and be comfortable for me. My feet feel really good now. They're tickling, honestly. Little sort of pleasant sort of itch. Cover of the skin around my feet. I was just meditating by myself. I stayed there much longer. It's pleasant. And then I go up to my ankles. I feel reasonably comfortable. My calves and the skin of my lower legs. And the muscles in my calves. I can feel that 
I did some walking earlier, so I could feel them. I'm actually quite comfortable. Then to my knees. Many people do have problems with their knees. So sitting on a chair is fine. But my knees are really comfortable. Do you need to move, adjust the position of your knees? If so, why not? Do the fidgeting at the beginning of a meditation so that soon the body is as comfortable. You're actually practicing kindfulness. Kind in that part of your body and mindful, aware of it. The lovely thing about the awareness, the mindfulness, it does give you feedback. In other words, you can see just how it is progressing, whether your knees, and now I've got up to my thighs, whether they are really comfortable in a way which is sustainable for the period of meditation. My, my knees feel fine. My thighs are just really comfy. Now go to my butt. Just above my butt, I can feel my back it needs to be straightened. So I will move. Get it right at the beginning. You have no worries later on. Oh, that feels better. It really does. I also keep precepts, as you all know. So I won't bend the truth for you. How I say is how I feel. So I get my butt just comfortable on the chair. And my back, I straighten up a bit. Oh, that feels so much more powerful. Interesting the way we use words, powerful and comfortable. So do you need to move your back to make it feel good? Later on, you might just leave the back alone and it moves itself. I've often found that it straightens itself, or it leans back, moves to one side. Trust your body. If the body wants to move, let it. So right now, you just make sure it's as comfortable as possible with your awareness and the underlying kindness. I go to my shoulders, just roll them a little bit, make them nice and comfy. And down my arms. Oh, my arms feel so nice. Oh, I just picked up. It often happens to me just in summertime, because you wear your robes over one shoulder, and it's a bit of tightness there. And that sort of tightness, it just means the robes just bite into a bit too hard into the shoulder. It makes it a bit sore. So how is your dress? Close your way. Make sure they're comfortable. Don't be too cold, too hot, too tight. Loose-fitting clothes are the best. Then I also make sure I go to the torso. So sort of like going up the, the top part of the body a second time, but this time in the front to make sure all my organs, digestive tract is all in good working order. Your own intestines. intestines, your stomach, your lungs, it doesn't matter what it actually is, you just feel them and you relax every part of them as much as you can. How you relax parts of your body, this is what you learn from trial and error and the mindfulness which learns what works and what doesn't work. And soon you can take almost any part of your body. And there may be a bruise, or maybe a wound, or maybe a cancer. You can focus on that, not with fear, but with kindness. And the thing just starts to disappear. 
You don't want it to disappear because that's too much extra stress. Just let it be. It's beautiful kindness. I often thought the kindness is one of the most important parts of healing. And then you go down your, your arms and your elbows and forearms and wrists. I remember just saying this when I did the meditation on Saturday in Perth. When I look at my hands, I get down there and they're all in the wrong place, my fingers. I don't know why I always do that. But when I meditate and have a look, it's obvious and I just move my hands, which I'm now doing. Once they're comfortable, my whole arms and shoulders are really nice at ease. And again, just like with my feet, it feels good. I pick up the pleasure, I'm aware of that pleasure of comfort of the body, the body being at ease, relaxed. And because that's pleasant, it's really easy to stay in the present moment and to enjoy it. If there was some pain, some aches, then I would just want to move and find a place where those pains don't exist. Once it's present, it's easy to stay here and be still. And then the mindfulness increases, the joy increases, the comfort increases. Fantastic way to meditate. Then I go to my neck. Still hay fever season over here in Western Australia, but it's really lessened now. Most farmers have bailed their hay. They live out in the countryside. So that's what happens out here. But my throat is a tiny bit itchy. So I'm aware of that. I relax it. Of all these years, you've learned what attitude is necessary to give things like an itchy throat some peace, some healing. And then I go to the front of my face. And I do this because then in the front of the face, around the eyes, the nose, the mouth, forehead if you wish. Sometimes the people have aches and pains or stress because of emotions creating that particular configuration of the muscles of the face. But I know those muscles, been aware of them for years. I also know how to relax them taking the muscles around my eyes and loosening them. I can notice the feeling changes. You get more at ease. Same with the muscles around my mouth. Feel them. Relax them. How to relax? Just keep on trying, trial and error. Kindness, mindfulness, and little by little you learn. Now my face feels so comfortable. I'm caring for it. It relaxes. There's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing I need, nothing I need to get rid of. Just comfortably, contentedly being here. And of course, that also relaxes many emotions, which sometimes screw up the facial muscles. And now I feel my whole body sitting here. My feet, my back. 
my head, my face. I feel so relaxed. If you do notice the joy of relaxation, stay there. Make that the meditation object for you. The present, relaxed bodily feelings. You'll find that the body relaxes even more when you value relaxation. You don't just take it for granted, so that's done, let's do something else. You're right in it. Pressure of a body which is now at ease, not asleep, aware, comfortable. And then, To me, it's happening naturally. Start becoming aware of my breathing. So my body is going, my attention is going inwards, away from the outside of the body, into the breath. Usually I go to my state of peace, first of all. Now it's just going straight to my breathing. Now I don't, I never watch my breath. I just like observe it passively. Like being a passenger, a passenger in a bus or in a car, I don't drive, I don't control things. I just watch. Now watching my breathing. Because this is happening, I invite you to follow if you wish, you don't have to. And I give this value and kindness to my breath. It's a good friend. We spent many hours together, my eyes closed, just watching my breath go in and go out. I don't want anything more. I'm not trying to exploit my breath to get something deeper. I'm valuing my breath for what it is right now. Enjoying its company. This makes me something very comfortable to watch. The simile which came up was like being in a hammock, lying back in a hammock, swinging to the left, swinging to the right, with the breath going in, the breath going out. Being in a hammock means no physical tension. If something is still moving, the breath going in, going out naturally. I'll never force it. I don't never force my breath, it's not afraid of me. I don't oppress it, don't dominate it. So my breath stays with me. It's so easy to watch, even though I'm talking to you. I haven't missed any breath since a couple of minutes ago. As I'm washing my, my breathing, just being a friend to it, being next to it, being with it, feeling comfortable with it, not trying to control it or own it. If it needs to disappear, it can do, I don't mind. You start to see more and more of your breathing. It's like I saw so much more of my body at the beginning of this meditation. The breath relaxes. It's not tense. It doesn't run away from me. Just here, peaceful. And I know I'm not going to rush off to the next stage. I'm opening up my lotus. stage of the breath. 
You know what happens next. You become more and more aware of your breath. Easily. I'm not afraid, I better be careful, otherwise my breath might disappear. Just totally at ease, at peace, relaxed. Like you're with a good friend having a good cup of tea or coffee. Having a wonderful time. Just being with your breath. You start to notice the beginning of your breath. And the first in-breath arises. See how it goes to its peak and then falls away. It's just one in-breath. My in-breath takes oh, maybe about 80% just to go in, and 20% it falls away very quickly. I can see the gaps between my breathings. The in-breath is finished, the out-breath doesn't go out yet. Does not need to? It does this all by itself. I don't exercise my will, my choice, my control at all. That's one of the reasons why things become peaceful. Just watching your breath, that's all, not doing anything. I'm not trying to get somewhere or attain anything. Just watching this breath happening now. Just like with the body awareness, the breath now starts to be joyful. The pity sukha starts to arise. It's a very pleasant thing to watch as you go deep into the lotus, the fragrance, the scent becomes stronger and more fragrant. And over soon these beautiful limiters rights will come up. So please excuse me, I'm going to be quiet for the next 15 minutes now. But I have determined to come out to end the meditation. Just in another 15 or 16 minutes time.
Getting close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel? Little by little, we start to become aware of our body. Hopefully, it's even more relaxed than when you began. You can know now how much you can learn. In every meditation, there's no such thing as a bad meditation. You learn so much and grow. And where you grow to is in a peace, wisdom, and kindness. So please just breathe in. <laughs> Breathe in so gently three more times, now three times, and then open your eyes and come out of the meditation. If you can come out with a smile, it's always really nice. Take the joy from inside into the outside. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to meditate with you. <laughs> Gratitude is really wonderful. So often we, oh, there's some of these uh, people that they're always on call if we need them for special driving or something. Okay to drive us today. You know what they say? They say, thank you for inviting me to help you. They really mean it. So for all of those who live anywhere close to Animal Chander, please, it's good fun to help out and to drive and cook and feed or whatever. I just really miss that for many years. It's those who give um, have gratitude those people we can give to. So today, I've got great gratitude for Enwood Chandra and all of the people in Anacom for Bikini Project for allowing me to give this opportunity to give a bit of Dhamma and a bit of meditation. But that's not all. More is coming later on. But right now, have a very good lunch, those of you who are eating. And I'm just going to go and have a cup of tea. That's what I can have at this time of the day. But it's nice. Thank you. Okay. okay. So see you later. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, bye. And I'll just say a few words. Bye. Okay. Those who are staying. But Ajahn, please take me. Okay. 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 Bye bye. So now is the circle break time. So see if you can take that piece, however humble it might seem, into your activities as you get up and maybe stretch and go to the loo and even the cooking meditation, if you are going to have your lunch. I know some of you are actually not in Europe. I think we have someone from America and I'm not sure how far east we go uh, because of the time zone, but um, Steve.
everything you do can be an act of love and kindness and care towards yourself and do it with awareness and kindness. So even when you make your meal, don't just rush to make the quickest, easiest thing, but really put extra care and attention into how you nourish yourself, because that will feed into your practice. And hopefully there may be a little time for rest either before or after the next session. I'm really looking forward to that because I'm quite tired. So um, yeah, we do also uh, recommend and ask if you would to try to come a little bit early for each session. Um, even if we're not letting you in until the starting time, it's really helpful because our co-hosts, Matthias and Derek and Vinny, that way they can let you in just on time and then enjoy the practice themselves. So if you are late, they have to keep an eye out. They can't meditate. So that would be very, very helpful for us. And uh, we will close the meeting now. So you can sign out. You can just leave the meeting room and we'll open it up again at about, uh, when's the next session? Quarter to 12, right? So we'll open it up at about quarter to 12. So you can log in and then enjoy your breathing until we begin. Okay. So have a lovely in-between period and we'll see you soon. Take care.